all about. And then Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost theme. And the Holy Ghost, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and kindle them with the fire of divine love, sing forth thy spirit, and they shall be created. And thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Yes, God who has filled the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Ghost, shine there by the gift of the same spirit, remember truly wise, and give rejoice in his consolations through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Our Lady, help the Christians. Pray for us. Pray for the Father and his Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen. So, uh, Father, Father Toik asked me to do an adult catechism. He's away in single this week, so uh, I thought what would probably be of interest to, I guess, most people is any places that our Lord has gone to. Uh, if you've ever been to a pilgrimage to the Holy Land, then this presentation may not be particularly interesting to you. If you've never been to the Holy Land or have never been to these particular places in the Holy Land, then this presentation may be of significant interest to you. The benefits of seeing the Holy Land is not only the possibility to do the pilgrimage and actually physically go to the sites, pray at the places, ask for special graces, which you wouldn't be able to do any other way or any other time in your life, but also you can visualise. You can now, you start to visualise the places. So that when you're praying, and you're praying, praying the, the, the mysteries of the rosary, for example, um, the visitation, Bethlehem, you can actually physically, um, mentally produce images for yourself of what it really is like, because the Holy Land now, days, landscape-wise, um, is very much the same as what it was 2,000 years ago. And many of the cultures are very much the same as what it was 2,000 years ago. And, of course, the churches were not there 2,000 years ago. There were synagogues and the temples and things like that. But what was there is really is, is still very fascinating. Um, or when I go through, I'll sort of explain it. So those who just arrived, we're doing a presentation on the Holy Land and um, the different places of, the, of our Lord's life. Now, what I thought was I'll, I'll just focus on places which are relevant to the Gospels, places which are relevant to the mysteries of the rosary because I think those would be of the most benefit to you there's a lot of places to see we when I went there I spent and when you're on a pilgrimage with an organized group um, and we spent 10 days um, and these are the not all the places we visited but those are the ones where um, where there's some interest for us tonight not that we will have a chance to see all of it <coughs> One place I'll take you first of all is Mount Nebo. Not because it's where our Lord went, but more importantly, it's where Moses went. So right at the end of Moses' life, after 40 years in the desert, and leading millions of Israelites towards the promised land, he, he arrives at a place called Mount Nebo. And then from Mount Nebo, he is allowed to see the promised land. Come in, come in. Sorry, we're using this room because we need a digital projector. Um, we really probably need someone at the, at the door directing people across. If there's no one else missing. Um, for those who just arrived, we're doing a presentation on the Holy Land that I'm taking you through the Gospel scene. Thank you, Father. For those who have uh, been here since the beginning, they've heard that three times, and so now I think they know what we're doing. <laughs> um, Mount Nebo. Moses, at the end of his life, after 40 years in the, in, in the desert, leading the, a million plus Israelites through the desert, only three of the Israelites would have a, would, would, would be able, who, who left Egypt would make it through those 40 years. Only three. Moses wouldn't make it through to the Holy Land. He was punished because of the water of the contradiction. He doubted our Lord, God's promise, and he, he, he struck the, the rock twice. Um, and so God said, you will not, at the punishment, you will not enter into the Holy Land. When he got to the top of the mountain and saw the Holy Land, this is pretty much what he saw. Now, you'd look at that and you'd go, land flying with milk and honey. Hmm, where's the milk, where's the honey? Um, what you're actually seeing is, 
And there's a lot. Was it was the day that I went there? There was a it was the day after there was a significant dust storm that went through. So you're still seeing the haze from the dust storm. So you're not actually seeing the green landscape beyond, which is where they were getting. Jericho is 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 is. is Jericho is down through here. Um, and they will, the Israelites will come and they will cross through the river of, um, the Jordan River, and then they'll make their way into Jericho. And they'll conquer the city of Jericho. So that's what Moses saw. Um, you know when our Lord rose from the dead, there was a big obstacle that wasn't an obstacle to him. It was the door, it was the stone at the door of the tomb. And the, the, the door of the tomb needed, and when, when they arrived, said, we need men to roll back the stone. And you and I would think it must have just been a plain great boulder, and they just sort of need leverage and stuff to get it out. It wasn't a great boulder. It was this. This is a tombstone door. And the way it works is that there's a flat edge, or if it's not a flat edge, it's round. They roll it into position and it rolls into a, into, a, into a slot and you can't move it. You need literally at least three men to lever it out of its position. That's what that is, just out of curiosity. So when you're thinking on Easter morning about um, the resurrection of our Lord and as rapid images of Easter eggs cross your mind, you can try to counter them with an image of the stone. Um, good. Do you remember when Moses was called by our Lord to begin his uh, mission to lead the Israelites through the Promised Land, and he saw on the mountain um, a fire, a, a, a fiery bush? Um, well, it would have been something like that. That was on Mount Nebo. There's actually a guy there. Uh, it's apparently control burning, but I couldn't see the guy, all I could see was the fire, and uh, I was waiting for a voice to come out, <laughs> but it didn't. If it did come out, it would have been this bloke probably saying, get away! <laughs> control burning, it's out of control. Uh, so those are, that's just Mount Nebo, that's just a Snippet. Let's take you to the Dead Sea. Who knows anything about the Dead Sea? Don't tell me it's where there are people get buried. It's salty. It's Don't dead. tell me it's the dead center of the Holy Land. It's dead. <laughs> it's dead. It's very salty. It has five times the content of normal sea salt. So for health um, fanatics, it's a fantastic place to go because apparently it's very good for your skin, especially the mud. So. The Dead Sea was, is, is, is dead, the result of, it's actually not a sea, it's actually not linked with the ocean at all. It's actually a lake, um, but it's below sea level and the, the area around the Dead Sea is incredibly acidic and incredibly salty. So all the ground is putrefied with salt, um, nothing grows, it's right on the border of Sodom and Gomorrah. That's where Sodom and Gomorrah was. So nothing, God punished Sodom and Gomorrah to the point where it's not only the city was destroyed, but it seems that the whole place was laced with natural salt, so nothing would ever grow there again. The land became completely desolate and infertile to this very day, it still is. And yet, there Sorry, is... Sorry, just to clarify, did you yeah. say it is the site of old Sodom and Gomorrah? It's the site of Sodom and Gomorrah, according to archaeological findings. Yeah. So, despite that, there is this little oasis, which is this hotel that we stayed at. And that's the Dead Sea. Now, it doesn't look very dead, does it? It is, in fact, dead. Nothing swims in it, nothing lives in it, nothing grows in it. It's just entirely salty. Um, you can swim in it, but you literally float like a bob. Literally float like a bob. If you didn't meet the guy, he tried to take swimming lessons. It's, he was an Irishman. And um, he had no arms and he had no legs. And the instructor said, Good morning. 
He said, I'd like to learn to swim. He said, my name is Bob. He said, be fine. Well, it must have good floating because everyone I know who's gone to uh, the Holy Land, they always put up a stupid profile picture on Facebook of them reading a newspaper or something. Yeah, you can see. and it's that's like... exactly what you can do. So there you go, here's an example. You can just swim. But don't put your head under because it's so salty that it's actually really, really corrosive. It's actually very bad for your skin. Um, some people that's really good for their skin, but it's actually not really good for your skin. Um, uh, you put your head under, you take it in, and you'll get a very, very, very upset stomach for the rest of the night. <clears throat> this is the mud that you're supposed to cover yourself with. And some of them did. <laughs> okay, good. Now, this, what you're seeing here, I'll pause that for a second. Um, you know Abraham. <coughs> um, Abraham was a nomad. So... He spent his whole life living in tents. What you're seeing in the background are the Bedouins. They are the tents of the Bedouin. Bedouin are nomads who just travel around. They have no land that they live on and that they own. They just move from place to place with the livestock and and uh, and and their. They, they'll have a few vehicles, and they live in these arid conditions. It's, it's pretty impressive. Um, so like I said, you know, it's still to this very day very similar to what it was in the time of, of our Lord and what the time was in the time of Moses. There's another Bedouin campsite. And this is the land flowing with milk and honey. <laughs> it gets better, don't worry. It gets a lot better. Um, Interesting, just an interesting point about the, the cattle that they have. So they have sheep. Their livestock is mostly sheep. Um, the sheep are so used to finding tiny little bits of grass, a blade here, a blade here, a blade here, and they're just constantly on the move, eating a blade wherever they can find one. Um, but they're the kind of cattle that they're breeded, that if you will put them in a nice lush paddock, like you would find in you know, um, Victoria, for example, they will actually kill themselves because they don't know how to stop eating. They just see and eat. It's what some people call a seafood diet. They see and eat. Um, and, and they literally would explode from the, from the, from the content of their, of their eating. So unlike our sheep here who can actually moderate their intake, those sheep can't because they're so used to not having enough to eat. They just, when they see food, they just go for it. Our uh, sheep also explode sometimes if they're on clover too much. If they're on clover, yeah, that's right. But that's for other reasons, not so much for the amount that they can eat. Um, okay, good. Let's go to the first public moments of our Lord's life, which is his baptism. I think there's a few other little places in a second, but let's go to the baptism first. So this is the actual, actual archaeological site of the baptism of our Lord. Now, the River Jordan, you're going, where is the River Jordan? The answer is the River Jordan has taken different routes over the centuries. So it's no longer flowing through this area. Uh, you can see, you can see another area through which it, 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 it was flowing, but it no longer is as well. These are the four pillars of a church above. These are the steps down underneath the church to the water, the river that would flow underneath, and they would perform ceremonial baptisms there for the early Christians. Uh, so this, these, these are the remnants of a church that was probably in around, and then probably uh, about the fourth century AD. Um, and so this is the actual site. We know for sure this is the actual site where our Lord was baptised because the tradition it goes right back to this point and because of the archaeological evidence is so strong at this point that we know that that was what it was used for. Okay, this is the River Jordan where it's most commonly um, accessed for the purpose of um, baptisms. So there you go, I got baptised, or at least my feet did. <laughs> And, and this is a person not getting strangled. 
Um, it's not, uh, it's not worry, it's all right. Um, Are they Protestant? They're probably, <laughs> probably evangelical or something, yeah. And he's, he's done King Bear. She's probably a born again Christian or something. Uh, question. Yeah. Um, he wouldn't have used in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Ghost, would he? Oh, look, I don't even know if he's doing a proper baptism. He no, just I'm, doing I'm a... talking about Eli. Oh, who, who, who? Who's he? Um, John the Baptist. Yeah, John the Baptist. John the Baptist. John the Baptist's baptism was not a baptism that yeah. conferred grace, no. Yeah. It was just a baptism that initiated you into leading a life according to the Ten Commandments, <coughs> and from that you would prepare yourself for the baptism of our Lord. Right. If you understand, yeah. This bloke's moving to cross, so he's presumably Christian. Yeah. Um, the River Jordan, not looking particularly attractive in that in that um, place and what's really interesting is you would think the river jordan would have been a, like a really wide river uh it wasn't actually it was actually a relatively small river so it wasn't massively difficult to cross but it still posed problems for the israelites okay close to the place of the site of the baptism of our Lord is this hermitage. Now there's no one living in this cave anymore. <clears throat> this cave used to belong to a particular woman, a very eccentric woman. Um, her name was Saint Catherine of Egypt, uh, Saint Mary of Egypt. Uh, now the, the history is for her that she led a very, very bad life for a good number of years, and then she converted, and she wanted to spend a life of penance and liberation. <coughs> she would spend 30 years in this hermitage. You could not access that cave. There was no staircase. There was only a rope that went up, and she would, people would provide food from the near town, and then she would twist it up through a basket, and she would have her sustenance. She pretty much lived her whole life in this cave. Only near the end of her life, was she able to receive the sacrament, the sacrament of Holy Communion, and then the sacrament, oh sorry, sacrament of confession. Uh, no, uh, no, I think she, she did the sacrament of confession and then she went into her, her life of penance. Um, only later in her life was she able to receive Holy Communion once. And after that, 24 hours later, she died. And the priest brought her Holy Communion, himself was a very holy man, um, she received it once, it sanctified her so much that God was happy to take her at that point and, and lead her into heaven. Um, so the effects of one Holy Communion can be extraordinary when, of course, we're well disposed. Um, but, of course, she what had spent 30 years. Uh, this would have been the 4th century, I can't give you the okay. exact time, okay. the exact date or the year. So Mary of Egypt. Okay. So she didn't attend Sunday Mass, well. She didn't attend Sunday Mass. In fact, there wasn't necessarily Sunday Mass in the area. Um, she was very far away from most of the I wonder why the priest wasn't, wasn't getting the sacraments to her more frequently. Because she was right in the middle of the desert. Yeah, access to her was difficult. Okay. Yeah. Food could be brought to her from time to time. But also, I would say the scarcity of the priest. Good evening. Good evening. Um, <laughs> okay, so we went from the baptism. Baptism of our Lord to the 40 days of our Lord's fasting in the Mount of Temptation. This is the Mount of Temptation. So our Lord found there are it's, it's it's littered with caves all the way through the mountain uh, it's a very porous mountain a little bit like a sponge or, or, a, or a swiss cheese what's the name of the mountain sorry it's, called, Mount, it's called the mount of temptation okay yeah and for those who have just arrived 
this is before someone said this. Uh, we are going through the Holy Land, and I'm showing you particular um, points of interest in relation to our Lord's life. We've gone through, uh, we've looked at the baptism of our Lord, and we're now looking at his, the, the 40 days fasting in the desert, and this is the mountain on which he fasted 40 days. Uh, there's a monastery, it's right here. It's actually a Greek Orthodox monastery. And as you can see, the mountain is not incredibly high. Um, but as you can see, it's a very, very austere place. There's no vegetation, there's no, uh, there's nothing very attractive about it. So certainly you would not go there for any other reason than to perform penance. So this is where our Lord was tempted by the Spirit. This is where our Lord was tempted by the Spirit. Um, they were camels and they tried to make money off us. Was that the Jews so far? Or uh, no, no, they weren't. They were the locals. Oh, right. Yeah, that's a, it. Was a you'd record. expect it. Yeah. And they made some money. Show us some photos close up. And that's the monastery. Now, what's really interesting is that how the heck they managed to build it, I don't know. Obviously, they've got their caves, they've got their rooms inside the mountain, because all you're seeing here are some external buildings of internal dwellings, which must be connected and connected through hallways and rooms and stuff. So, fascinating spot. Now, do you remember our Lord uh, in Jericho? There was a young man, a, a tax collector, whose name was Zachary. Up in the tree. That's right, up in the tree. There's evidence of the missing link. And he, because he was a short man, needed to get some height so that he could see our Lord, and so he climbed this tree. This is apparently the tree that Zachary climbed. Um, if it's not, it's pretty old, as you can see from the, from the trunk. So it's probably one of the tree's brothers or sisters, so it's not the actual tree. But um, that's, that's the that's the tree climbed. Do you remember that St. Peter had a wife? And St. Peter's wife's mother was very, very sick. And uh, St. Peter had invited our Lord to his mother-in-law's house. Well, in fact, I think it was his house, and no, it was St. Peter's house, in order to have dinner. And the news came, sorry, there's no dinner tonight. Get takeaways because your, your mother-in-law is sick and our Lord doesn't like takeaways so our Lord heals her on the spot <laughs> now um, what you're seeing is a very modern church built above the archaeological site of the actual house itself of St. Peter so if I can get a shot of the actual house I'll show it to you. That's not the actual house. That's a monk doing his bravery if you believe me. He's taking a selfie. <laughs> <laughs> That's the house. So these are the remains. This is the wall. Obviously it's probably one of the external walls. And here's an internal wall and here's the other external wall. What was inc incredible is these houses were very, very small. This, this, this classroom would fit three or four houses in it. Um, they had one or two rooms. They used their houses for not much more than eating, dining, sleeping. And that was it. Uh, and yes, you would share rooms. So, um, so these, these houses were not... Were not What's were not the possible. mortar, do you know? Mud, I guess? It would have been, it would have been mud. It would have been well for last as long as that. Yeah, exactly. Well, of course, this has been unearthed, so it would have been submerged and preserved thanks to the, um, thanks to the earth around it. That's just looking down from above. Come on in. Yeah, I know. Oh, I'm, I'm, yeah, yeah, better see. We've had to um, take, take him back to primary school. Um, you managed to find us. Well done. We have been hiding. Thank you. 
excited. Sorry about the cheers, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm sure you're going to be very happy or very comfortable. Um, can I offer you something a little bit better? There is, there is, it's there is, like an assistant. No, 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 this is fine. Thank you, fine. Oh, I insist. Okay. I'm so sorry. That's what happens when you come late. This is the synagogue. This is the synagogue that St. Peter would attend in Capernaum. And it would have been the synagogue in which our Lord would have preached many times. In fact, I believe it's the synagogue in which our Lord um, was asked to... I don't know what's happened here. It's the synagogue in which our Lord was asked to... Uh, as, a, as, as, a, as, a, as a young Jewish rabbi, he was asked to speak. And so he took up the scriptures of Isaiah, and it read of a prophecy about the Messiah, a messianic prophecy, and he said, and uh, he read the words, and he said, um, "This day, this prophecy is fulfilled in your midst." Um, so that was the location in which he, in which he would have said that. So what you're, you've seen is obviously the, you've seen the internal walls there, a <coughs> little bit of. Um, Roman-esque sculpt, uh, sculptured pillars. You've seen the external wall here. Um, but yeah, there's not a lot left of that ancient synagogue. That's the interior of it. Is it like an SSP? Sorry, I'm, I'm not a... Oh. Not a person, but I'm just curious. Is there like an SSPX headquarters in no. the Holy Land or any no. presence? Or? No. Right, okay. And if you're a Christian, you don't have any rights in the Holy Land. Right, okay. Yeah, they're trying to get rid of them. Huh. Um, there's about 750,000 that still manage to live there, but their life is very restricted. They're second class citizens. Um, they, this is Palestine, very right? Or? This is the whole of Israel. Right, okay, yep. Yeah. It's a um, pretty horrible life for them. Um, wow. This was unearthed. You know about the the the, uh, the boat of St. Peter, in which, the bark of St. Peter, in which our Lord spent time sleeping in, uh, travelling across the Lake of Galilee. Um, the miraculous catches took place from the bark. Well, this came to surface about 20 years ago. Um, they managed to preserve it. As soon as the air got to it, it would start to crumble. So they had, thanks to the very, very clever archaeological techniques, they had ways of preserving it and being able to unearth it out of the mud and, and, and keep it. So this is the, what, what they were able to find. So this is, dates back to the time of our Lord. Is it the actual ark, uh, sorry, the bark of, 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 of St. Peter himself? Well, of course, there's no way of knowing. It's not like you, you, you've got some planks, you've got um, this belongs to St. Peter, can you keep your hands off? And like that. Um, so, but what we do know is that it would have been a bark that our, just like, or very similar to the bark of St. Peter, Peter himself. So you can see the size of it, you can see the style of it. And I mean, that's a good, that's a good 10 metres, 10, 15 metres. So they weren't tiny boats, they were significant sized boats. There was definitely room for our Lord to sit down and have a rest, to lie down and have a rest. That would have been the one he walked on water and all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He would have stepped over the side of that to walk on water. Take you to back to 
the Mount of Beatitudes. Of course, the Mount of Beatitudes is the place where I will preach the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are those who mourn and weep for their sins, um, for they shall receive, have consolation, etc., etc. So the Beatitudes. So this is the, the actual church of the Beatitudes, the site on which our Lord preached. He preached on the top of a on the top of a hill, uh, and 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 the people were in a sort of a valley, but an amphitheatre valley around him. So he would have been able to project his voice, and they would have been able to hear quite well. And this is the the the, the, the church, which is again, it's was built in. Um, built in the 1900s, as most of the churches were built in the 1900s, thanks to mostly um, uh, the liberation of the Holy Land from the Turks, which allowed the English to uh, start to revitalise the pilgrimages and allowed the Catholics to, to have um, access and presence to be able to rebuild the, the churches in a lot of the holy places. So you'll find that a lot of the, most of the churches in the Holy Land nowadays are modern churches, or um, although their, their style is still very um, traditional, um, thanks to the fact that they were built prior to the Second Vatican Council, um, they're not the ancient churches that you would expect to see, because the ancient churches were all destroyed by the Turks and by the Crusades. And notice they have a sense of no guns. No guns. <coughs> yeah, that's right. No eating. No smoking. No dogs. Oh, what? I know. Um, they're very. They're, they're not inclusive, are they? I was talking about smoking. Sorry. And no shorts or socks. Ah, <laughs> oh, well, I guess no. I, I guess it means <laughs> you know. <laughs> What's the third one? No, no lipstick. No lipstick. <laughs> oh, okay. It just said no lipstick. They should have an anti sign in it, basically. No, it means no talking. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Blessed are the silent. Okay, let's go to Galilee. So, of course, Galilee was the place where our Lord would um, spend almost all of his public life. Um, and the Sea of Galilee, which is actually not a sea again, it's a lake, but because of its size, um, lakes of large size were often called seas by the, by the, uh, by the Jews. So, so, and biblically, that's what they were referred to. So this is called a sea. Um, there's a sunrise over it on a beautiful calm day. Beautiful, fresh, clear water. We were just standing on the edge of the on the sea in the morning. Lake Galilee. Our Lord would have often walked these shores. Our Lord would have used this place as a place of meditation, contemplation. The you can you can imagine um, the apostles when they were in their boat when they were fishing um, after our Lord's resurrection. And uh, they've been out all night and they've been trying to catch fish and they haven't caught anything. And then someone stands on the edge of the lake and calls out to them, hey, have you got any fish? So this is what the scene would have looked like in the morning. And uh, of course they said, no, nothing. And then they said, well, put your net on the other side and you'll catch something. And they do and a great, uh, great catch is made, great draft of fish. So easy to visualise when you when you see the actual lake itself, Lake of Galilee. This is the church upon which um, is built the site where our Lord would do just that, appear to them after his resurrection, and would confer upon Peter what was known as the primacy of Saint Peter, which means would confer upon him the full power of the papacy. So he would ask him, Peter, do thou, does thou love us me? And Peter would say, Lord, do you know that I love thee? And he would ask him that triple act of love in reparation for the triple denial. Um, and that took place here on the on this very spot. And what's they what's the place called, sorry? For it's them? called the, the, the Church of the Primacy of Peter. Uh, I was able to celebrate Mass there. Um, 
We were actually on a boat on the Lake of Galilee. And these are the, these are the main places that I've talked about Mount Beatitude, Capernaum. I um, haven't talked about Bethesda. But those are the, that's the shoreline of Galilee, so you've been on your other side of the lake. And that's me celebrating Mass. Um, There's the church that I showed you before. It's just you know, you had to use an outside altar because, of course, you see so many pilgrims, you have to book months ahead if you want to use that church there. So these are the shorelines. So you remember the, uh, the event where our Lord would want to get away from the crowds and he would tell Peter and he would tell the apostles get in the boat, we're going across the lake. And they would aim for a quiet spot that our Lord knew, the apostles knew, that no one would have interruption, and they could have a bit of a day off, a bit of a day of recollection and quiet and refresh their spirits. Well, the spot they were aiming for was somewhere around about here. The people watched them go across the lake, and with their eagle eyes, they saw exactly where they were going. And they came across the shoreline and walked all the way along the edge of the lake until eventually they got to them. And, and then our Lord let himself be cornered and then he preached to them all day and then he needed to send them back. But some of them have been three days without eating and so he modified bread. And then after that, he revealed the mystery of the Holy Eucharist. So that's the context, that's the shoreline upon which these people walked and upon the area upon, around which our Lord um, preached. Uh, the, the Mount of Beatitudes is, is, is here. That's the church that I showed you. And that's, this is the amphitheater that I was talking about. So our Lord would have been preaching up here and the people would have been sort of in this area here listening to him preaching. <coughs> another shot. It's a very, very peaceful place, Galilee. Still good fishing. Very good fishing. The fish is great. So I talked about the modification of the bread, so the miracle of the modification, where our Lord obviously performed that miracle of modification many, many times, but the, the one that um, well, the one in which there is a site and a church dedicated to that miracle is, is, is this church here. This church. So it's the interior of the church. It looks like a person. I swear I've seen that like this place before. Yeah, which one? This one? No, let's go back. <laughs> The one with that, not that one. Ah, uh, what was the name? Uh, Doris? Doris? Not Doris. You, yeah, yeah. You would have seen some of them because they were some of them with me too. Right. I mean, all of them were from Australia, in fact. Ah. Uh, okay, so what's interesting about this church is the fact that it's the at the actual location of um, of our Lord's modification of the of the um, to feed the thousands with um, the bread and the fish um, is that what was they the were not called, sorry what was the church called church sorry? of the multiplication multiplication of the bread and the actual the actual name is that one church Hepta Pegon the seven springs <coughs> They're absolutely sure that this is the site of the very early pilgrims because they have diaries of the early pilgrims. When I talk about early pilgrims, I'm, I'm talking about Christians who would go and visit the Holy Land um, in the second, third, and fourth century. And they have their diaries. And in their diaries, they will relate very specific details very, about particular churches that they visited. And one of the details they relate is this detail here. They say, in the church of the multiplication of the loaves, 
was a mosaic on the floor um, up at the front, the site before the altar. And it had a basket with four loaves and two fish. But the gospel says five loaves and two fish. So why four loaves? And the pilgrim explains because the fifth loaf is on the altar. That's our Lord being sacrificed in the Mass. So they only put four loaves in to recall the fact that the multiplication still came taking place in a sense through the Holy Eucharist. So that detail being related, they knew when they uncovered this mosaic that they had found the actual place of the earliest pilgrimage site of that, of that miracle. Galilee. Uh, okay, just to show you how beautiful and tranquil the place is, if you will ignore my pathetic photography. <coughs> These birds didn't know that they were being watched. <laughs> So that's what the Jordan flows into, isn't it? Mm. Yes. In fact, the Jordan flows out of it. Flows out of it, okay, yeah. that's right. Yeah. This is our way. Yeah. Okay, how are we going for time? Good, a little bit more time. Let's move on to. Let's go to our Lord's very early life. So let's go to Nazareth, where our Lord grew up. Let's look at our Lord's hometown. How long were you there, son? Ten days. So this is the Church of the Annunciation. Now, as I said, they are reasonably modern-looking churches. The idea of this church was to design it looking like a, a lily, I think, in memory, upside down lily. Yeah, see, no mobile phones, no caps. Um, <coughs> no disorder, I'll just ignore it. That's the spot where the Annunciation took place. And there. So there's so many archaeological layers in this place, it's incredible. What you're seeing is walls from the Crusades of the um, 10th, uh, sorry, 11th and 12th, 13th century. There are a lot sort of along the back. You're seeing um, pillars from a, a, an earlier basilica. You're seeing the wall, interior walls of an earlier church, which is probably from about the 4th century. So you've got layers and layers and layers of archaeological history. Is that the ambo higher up than the altar? The, sorry? The ambo, like oh, where the homily is given from on the right-hand side? Oh, oh, move over. Yep, oh, keep going. That one right there. Oh, there. Is, is that higher than the altar? Well, yeah. The, the altar? yeah, 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 it is. Oh, it's a weird setup. Don't ask me what they're doing. Um, so that's the actual altar within the house in which um, Our Lady lived and uh, in which the words Verbum Caro Facta Mass it says here Verbum Caro Facta Mass and the word was made flesh that's where Our, Lord conceived, uh, our Lady conceived of Our Lord and it's just looking down on the same spot Father Ockus is celebrating Mass in the Church of the Annunciation on the main altar. And these are just some of the mosaics behind the main altar. As I say, they're quite modern. That's your dome above. So 
St. Joseph. Anyone who has a devotion to St. Joseph, I'm sure you all do. This is the house that St. Joseph built. Looks like someone's stomach, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it's actually underground. Now, it was very, very common in those days to build your house underground because it was a very stable environment in all seasons, temperature-wise. The ground temperature doesn't change across the whole year. So building underground, especially if you're in, an in, a, in, a, in a hot environment, is a very good idea. So, yeah, St. Joseph's house was underground. You can see the entrance, stairways down into this underground cave. And, uh, and I guess this was another exit. I'm not sure, it was a tunnel, probably connected to other grottos outside. Because they would use it as a church as well in the early days. So this is the church that was built above former church that was built above the house and this is what it would have probably looked like underground so it would have been a, a, a nice place to live um, it was a Jewish house so it had its it had its basis for purification so these were the steps you'd come down this was the place you'd, you'd bathe and you'd purify there'd always be water in there and, uh, and there would be, yes, um, both places were, were for purification. And that's what you saw, but that's the actual, the people don't just throw their litter, and those are actually petitions to St. Joseph. Hic erat subditum illus. Here he was, that's our Lord, subject to them. <coughs> and our lady, the house in which our Lord lived for near on 30 years. <coughs> so, some argue that he was our Lord, but our Lord lived in a cave, he's evidence of the first caveman. <coughs> Actually want some water? No, no, I'm good. Thank you. What father would, uh, when you ask, when a child asks for bread, would you give them rocks or something? <laughs> I was asking. I was going to ask you all to bless yourselves as you came in. That's so far, no? I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I mean, New South Wales government probably thinks it's the best thing to bless yourself with. <laughs> <laughs> Going to the Old Testament, the prophet Elias. Now, anyone who's a, a fond of the Carmelites or if you love St. Teresa and the child Jesus, St. Teresa of Avila or any other Carmelite saint, um, anyone who might be a third order Carmelite or might know someone who's a third order Carmelite, this is an incredibly important place because this is where the Carmelites began. This is the cave of Elias. Now, if you remember the story in the Old Testament where Elias was fleeing for his life, or at least he thought so, and he travelled 40 days to a particular mountain um, on the bread that the angel had given him. Uh, when he arrived at this mountain, he stayed there and he prayed, and it was revealed to him the will of God for him, which didn't reveal itself through thunder, or through an earthquake, but through a gentle breeze. In other words, God works um, in us in a very gentle way and will speak to us in silence. 
So this is the cave of Elias. And there's a monastery, a uh, Carmelite monastery built above this spot. And that's the outlook that he had. Of course, it wasn't as well developed in the time of Elias. Um, we're on Mount Carmel, which is um, actually a, a mountain on a peninsula on the west coast of the Holy Land. But this is the you know, this is the view that the Carmelites have when they wake up in the morning. It's pretty nice. That's not eating at the Carmelite Monastery, don't worry. That's just eating in a restaurant um, with the same view. That's our pilgrimage group. So they're all, all, they're all Aussies. And there's the cave underneath. And of course, this is the church, and there's the altar, and there's Our Lady of Mount Carmel <coughs> above. Very, very beautiful statue of her. I think I took a better shot than that. No, that's not a good shot. I might have taken a better shot. No, I didn't. Right. Mm -hmm. right. How did that church survive the Turks? Were they scared of the Nazis? It was built later. It was not built during the time of the Turks. Right. Yeah, so it's a 19th century church, uh, 20th century church. Um, here, so this this says, um, uh, Hunt Ali Kondo. So here, at some time, was the cave in which the great prophet himself, Elias, um, uh, the, the, the father and the, the the head of the Carmelites lived. <coughs> There you go, there's the statue. So all of you wearing a scapula, you can touch the scapula and say God protect me early of Mount Carmel. Okay, we'll go to Bethlehem now. Now, what's really interesting in the Holy Land is that Bethlehem is an enclosed location. There are particular... Okay, you, you'll be able to relate to this because you went through COVID. You are familiar with not being able to go beyond certain limits. In Victoria, we weren't allowed to go beyond 10 kilometres, 5 kilometres. 5 kilometres of our home, except for five essential reasons. Um, and in Bethlehem, it's a town in which the children have grown up, they are teenagers, they have never been beyond the town of Bethlehem. They're not allowed to step outside the walls, they have to have particular documents, permissions, etc. etc. Um, they're walled in, and they're walled in because that's what's happened in the Holy Land. It's very segregated, and there are certain places you can and you can't go. Um, obviously, being tourists, we had access thanks to our tourist guides, but the people in the Holy Land, a lot of them don't have access. It's, uh, it's a very, very horrible place to live, unfortunately, and it's all thanks to, I'm sorry to say it, the Jews, it's thanks to the Israelites, the, 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 those who are trying to dominate and make it an entirely Jewish state. <coughs> So, the birthplace of St. John the Baptist, first of all, whoops, um, go too straight to it. Here we go. Benedictus Dominus Israel, Quia Visitavit et Fetched Redemption. Blessed is the Lord God of Israel because he has visited and um, made the redemption. redemption, redemption. Um, it's the spot upon which the prophecy of Zachari, Zachari, who was the father of John the Baptist, this is the spot in which that prophecy was made. And this is the very spot, Hick. Precursor Domini Natus Est. 
ere the precursor of the Lord was born. <coughs> As good, is it true that Bethlehem is the only historical place not mentioned in the Old Testament? I don't remember the name being mentioned in the Old Testament. Do you remember it being mentioned in the Old Testament? I don't remember it. That's the only place that... Wait, so I know it's David was from Bethlehem. Yeah. Did, um, did it actually mention Bethlehem when it mentioned David? Don't know. Don't know. <coughs> don't know, but David is from Bethlehem. Right. All the lineage of King David is from Bethlehem. Yeah, no, I'm not... Yeah. Um, it's, it's always been a, a very wild, wild, but never mentioned in, in the Old Testament. Mm. It is mentioned in relation to the birth of Amos and the match I went to verify, um, to ask of the, um, of the, of the learned men where the, where the Messiah would be born, and that's... Um, that's the New Testament, though. He's talking about the Old Testament. But didn't they... <coughs> oh, they, I see they, what you're saying. They actually, they actually mm. referred to the... To the prophecy of the Old Testament, and that mentions that's that right. That was specified. Yeah. 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 So that's right. <laughs> okay, this has what's called the cross, the Crusaders' cross, or the cross of Jerusalem, and it has the main cross, and then it has the four crosses. So the four crosses represent the gospel going to the four ends of the world. They also represent the four, um, the four writers of the gospels: Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They also represent the four countries that were involved in the Crusades. There's a lot of um, a lot of symbolism in that cross, and so you'll find that the cross with the four crosses around it. You'll find that's a, a common, um, very common in Jerusalem. And very common when you hear or read or see pictures on on, on things like the Crusades. That's actually a Orthodox, Greek Orthodox um, church. I just took a photo of it because it looks interesting. And what are they? Schismatics or heretics? Both. Mostly schismatics. Pretty much. Is pretty, I mean, the heretics One leads they into deny, the other. Yeah, they deny the papacy, and so that's obviously heresy. Um, they're, they're schismatic because, precisely because they deny the papacy and they deny that the Pope has any authority <coughs> over above anyone else, especially especially the Patriarch of um, Constantinople. Isn't also their understanding of the Trinity as well? They, yes it is. Yes, and there are a few other things that they disagree with the Catholic Church about in relation to purgatory. They've got some issues in relation to any dogmas about the Blessed Virgin Mary after about the 10th century. Um, so why can we go and receive communion from can't. Us, Well, <coughs> if you want to be a novice order, you can. Yeah, that's you what I mean. Like, why is that now? Mechanics. Why is that? Because of ecumenism. Because of ecumenism. That's the only reason why. Yeah. Yeah, you can go and receive communion in the Anglican Church, and Anglicans can come and receive them in the Catholic Church now. No, it's all messed up. Stuff. <coughs> um, so we we'll go to Bethlehem. <coughs> Sorry about it downloads because a lot of this is stored in the cloud. Yeah, it's not Alright, so this is the town of Bethlehem nowadays. A very, very built up, um, congested little town. I don't know the population, several hundred thousand probably. Time of our Lord, Bethlehem was probably not even 5,000. Oh, <coughs> probably not even 500 of that. This is the church, the interior of the church, which is the church in the Nativity of our Lord. And when you go underneath the main altar, so this is the main altar here. It's all sort of like very Eastern in its style. So um, they like these, 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 are, these are lots and lots of votive lamps. So these are all lamps. And they'll put candles in them and everything, and they'll turn off the lights and everything will light up like, um, you know, um, uh, chandeliers. So it can be very beautiful in its own way. Um, 
Now, to get into the church that you just saw the inside of, you have to duck down like this lady is doing. Now, this lady is probably only about this high, so when I had to do it, I had to like do it like that <laughs> to get in. And the reason for that is several. First of all, because it was a sacred sanctuary, they did not want the crusaders rocking up to the churches and just bolting in with their horses, which is what they would do, and also using these churches as places, because the Turks would do this, um, to, 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 to store their horses, so using them as stables, basically. Um, so they, they made the only entrance this. But the other reason is because if you want to access our Lord's, you have to humble yourself. So if our Lord was humbled himself to being born in a cave, in a stable, then should we not humble ourselves to enter into his like a camel places through the eye of a needle? Like a camel through the eye of a needle, yeah. Alright, so we're going down mm. the staircase into the place below the old main altar. There's the main altar. We're going down the staircase. St. Jerome, because St. Jerome lived in a cave um, at this very site for many years. And this is the actual place where our Lord was born on Christmas Day. This is the, this is the location, this is the site. It's a very congested What's this church box. called, sorry, Father? The Church of the, of the Nativity. I used to be pedantic, Father, but I don't think it was actually Christmas Day when he was born, was it? 24th of December is according to your tradition when he was born. Yes, but it was Christmas Day. Would have been someone later who called it Christmas Day. Yes. <laughs> yes, our lady probably wasn't expecting St. <clears throat> Joseph to come in and say, Merry Christmas! <laughs> <laughs> The shepherds always play an important part, and this is the place in which they were visited by the angels. We're going for time. Five minutes left. Um, so this is a, a church, and on each one, if you can imagine a circular church, and you can imagine um, a dome or the sides of the church all coming towards a dome, and they will have these circular paintings, and each one of these circular paintings represent the, the shepherds, so it's the Church of the Shepherds. It's the exterior of it. Where is it? Bethlehem, is it? Yes, this is Bethlehem. That's very pretty. Yeah. And there we go, yeah, it's very pretty. And that's underneath. So this is the cave in which they were, they were, um, they were, what was the word, probably um, spending the night. So it was actually an open cave. So if you can imagine a very large, if you can imagine all of this just being open to the sky, they've walled it up since. Is this after they saw the birth, of, like saw our Lord in uh... the walling up? Yeah. yeah, no, no, yeah, sorry, yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So this became a church. Gotcha. Obviously, centuries are, several centuries after that, they made it into a church, um, and they wore it up at that point. And, uh, and we are, we're celebrating Mass in that spot at the moment, you know, on that, on that day we were at it. But in January, it was not far from the time of Christmas. No guitars in that mess, Father? No. No. We, uh, we, uh, can't play them to save our lives. <laughs> so that helps you visualize, you know, if you're trying to meditate on the third of the mystery, for example, you want to think about the shepherds. You've got an idea of what the table was like that they were waiting under when they were visited by the angels. More cave men. Church 
Church of the Visitation. So, um, Elizabeth, Saint Elizabeth, um, she lived in an area not far from Jerusalem, probably about an hour's, it's about 15 minutes drive, probably about an hour to a couple of hours walk from Jerusalem. Uh, they were pretty well off. So they had a pretty nice house. They were, they had their own servants, they had their own setup. They were on a, a high hill, they had a beautiful, uh, you know, um, uh, view of the valley below. And the church now that you see is obviously not their house. It's, it's what was um, built many, many years later. In fact, it was built in the 19th, 20th century. But this is where Our Lady would sing the Magnificat to, or probably say, but you know, I'm sure she said it in such a beautiful way that it's how much she was singing it. And, uh, and, and she would, and, and then Saint Elizabeth would reply, what is this that the mother of my Lord should come unto me? And then our Lord sanctified Saint John in the womb of um, Elizabeth at that moment. And this is, this is the spot, this is the place where it, where it happened. This is the well. So of course every house had its source of water because they were a wealthy house. They didn't have to go down to the community well. They had their own well. And, uh, and of course that's where you know, um, Elizabeth, Our Lady, would have drawn the water when she was there helping Elizabeth through her, <coughs> through her um, months to walk through, um, delivery. So Elizabeth's house is up on a hill. This is the view. This is the view you're seeing okay. the new house. So her bedroom window looked <coughs> out over this. And our lady's house is where? Down in the valley, in the bottom of the valley somewhere. Well, Elizabeth lived very close to Jerusalem because she was married to a Levite who was a priest. A priest, yes. And therefore he needed to be, he needed to be close to <coughs> Jerusalem. Yes. Whereas our lady lived in Galilee, uh, sorry, Nazareth which was about five days journey north of five Jerusalem. Days. What, what sort of country? Rocky, hilly country? Quite hilly country. You can see what you just saw now is the, yeah. is the hilly country leading up to Jerusalem. I know we're running out of time, Father, but do you have um, photos or video of the uh, crucifixion site? Yes, yes, okay, I'll take you to that now. <laughs> go to Old Jerusalem. Um, I'll take you to the I'll, I'll take you through the way of the cross. So to give you a little bit of background about the way of the cross, it still follows the what is believed to be the traditional route that our Lord walked when he carried his cross. Um, I don't know why that's not open. Okay. Um, it's pause that. I'll pause that. Uh, sorry about the music. It's the really wrong music to have with the way of the cross. Um, when I put this together, I chose a really good music, and it defaulted back to this, back to this, um, yeah, guitar music. Anyway, um, so the. The way of the cross <clears throat> is a very, very strong tradition. It was believed that Our Lady walked the way of the cross many, many times when she was in Jerusalem, and the Holy Woman would have done the same thing as well. And from that, it was traced out and then passed on exactly where our Lord um, went and then what, what happened on the way of the cross. You could have more stations, you could have less stations. The station, the, the number is not super important. What's hap you know, what's mentioned is more important in each station. Um, what you're seeing there is the, the Litostrotov, which is the place of judgment. So our Lord would have been standing on these very pavers and he would have been judged and condemned by Pilate standing on those very pavers. So the pavers are smooth because the people are kissing them um, in our generation. So 
So these, obviously, the buildings weren't of that style, but there would have been buildings of that height and probably more Roman looking or more, more Middle Eastern looking. Um, but you can see the narrowness of the streets. That's exactly what it would have been like. And you can see the paving on the streets. It would have been like that as well. So our Lord wasn't walking out in the country. He was walking through the middle of a very congested city um, in the middle of a very <coughs> middle of peak season, peak traffic. Because everyone was coming there for the Passover. They were, they were swarming with, um, with pilgrims. Um, our Lord falls for the first time under the weight of the cross. So this is the third station. So we actually carried a cross as we went. And we actually did the way of the cross as we went. Fourth station was where Our Lady meets our Lord. Not much of a cross, so sorry. Yeah. <laughs> well, we had to get it on the bus. <laughs> Those crutches are a bit more of a cross, aren't they, Dennis? <laughs> I'm told that the cross arm was about eight feet and the, the vertical was about, uh, I think, 16 feet long. Would you get cross if I contradicted you? Sorry? No, oh, sorry. No, I, I, no, I've read it or heard it somewhere. And it would have been, you know, like um, 250 mils by probably by about 80, 80 or 90 mils thick. It's a fairly heavy chunk of timber. Yeah, yeah. I don't was. know what sort of timber it was, but it would have been some weight in it. It was. It was very heavy. It was very heavy. And so there are different theories about whether our Lord carried the whole cross, or whether he only carried the vertical, the, the, the horizontal beam. Um, we don't know. Um, if he carried the whole cross, it was, it was very heavy. It would have been crushed in weight. Mm. So some say it was too, would have been too heavy to physically carry especially by someone under his, you know, in his condition. Um, but we don't know. But we, are, we obviously picture him carrying it because, because our Lord and the cross are never separated. Just um, as the normal form of crucifixion, were criminals asked to carry their own, or told to carry their own cross by Christ? Or was that the normal way to do it? Or they... It was would depend upon the criminal and what they could do because what was important for them was not to die on the way. Right. So if they got to the point where they couldn't cope anymore, then someone else would carry the cross. Simon was really stepped into that point, didn't he? To say, look, it looks like our Lord wants me to make it. Yeah. Yeah. Was it common? Yes, it was common for you to carry your own your own instrument of torture to your place of death, yeah. That was part of the humiliation. These are the um, stones that the Crusaders put up back in the 12th century, 13th century, um, and they mark the actual places of this, each station. So we always look out for these on the way when we knew we were at each station. You can see very narrow streets, just like they would have been in the time of our Lord. We're coming to now the 10th station. This is the entrance to the church of the well, there are several churches interconnected with each other here the church of the crucifixion, the church of the burial the church of the resurrection um, so you're going to see them yeah, I've got to have time off let's finish very soon and the problem with these, this place is that it's shared shared by several factioning groups. <clears throat> it was climbing to Calvary, up the staircase, and this is the rock um, upon which the <clears throat> crucifix would have been sort of, you know, gone into um, and it would have been inserted. They would have carved a hole in the rock and then the wood of the rock would have been put in and then just jammed in with wedges to hold it. And this is the rock. And the rock is split. And of course, you know there was a, an earthquake which split the rock. And the archaeological evidence shows that the rock, and to this very down Calvary, is split against the grains, which means the splitting couldn't have taken place except by an incredible force. 
because when you split a rock against the grain, it's not because it's the natural consequence of heat or weathering, it's the consequence of an extreme force that caused it to do that, which was the earthquake. So underneath that altar, so people are bowing down and they're kissing the actual rock upon which our Lord was crucified, uh, the, the, um, the place of the crucifixion. Um, we go to the 13th station. So our Lord's body was prepared for burial. This is the stone upon which our Lord's body was prepared for burial. This is the entrance way to the place, the burial chamber, chamber of our Lord. Now there's a big, ornate, structured oratory, external oratory around the outside of it, so it looks very ornate. Now, of course, at that time it was just a cave hewed into a rock. The time of our Lord is. We were able to celebrate Mass there. So this is the slab upon which our Lord was buried, uh, his body was laid, and um, this is the altar of that they placed above the slab. And there are two chambers. There is a chamber known as the chamber of the angels, and then the chamber of the actual burial. Now our Lord's body was not put into, into the final chamber. I think there were actually three chambers. Our Lord's body wasn't apparently put into the third chamber that you would only do that after three days and the reason why you would only do that after three days is because they wanted to make sure you were actually dead so they would come in after three days if you were your body was corrupting then they knew to move your body into the third chamber so this is the second chamber and it's the chamber of the angels and it's the place in which the angels would have appeared to, to um, the holy women and saint john and saint peter So this is the antechamber, and we all had to crowd into that. And then this is just last shot. So this is in here is where the mass took place, and this is the large structure above it. And then that's the church within which this small origin is Amen. Sorry, Father. Um, just before we all go, um, we are doing paella tonight at Michael's Study's house just around the corner. If you're keen on coming on Johnny's for dinner, um, we do go to Conklin first, but um, afterwards if you want dinner, you generally go to Michael's Study's. Father, that invite's open to you as well. We generally bring Father along if he's free, so. No worries. Um, yeah, happy to join you. Excellent. Yeah, uh, five minute walk from here as well. Yeah. So, okay. so you'll have a mini pilgrimage. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Trying to keep the 15 decades in the way. It's <laughs> <laughs> good. Okay, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Carl. 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 Thank you, Thank you. Thank you.